good morning students welcome to the lecture on basics of electrical and electronics engineering myself shrimati rupa m selection grade lecturer pvp polytechnic let us begin the 14th session and today we will be dealing with electric motor drives which is the unit 4 in your syllabus so in this chapter we will be studying about dc motors so we'll study about the working principle fleming's left hand rule types of dc motors series motor shunt motor compound motor and in compound motor there are two types cumulative compound and differential compound motors and finally we will study the applications of the motors let us define what is a dc motor dc motor is an electromagnetic machine which converts direct current electrical energy to mechanical energy it is a dynamic machine so it converts electrical energy into mechanical energy it is called as a dynamic machine because it has got rotating parts in the machine so this is the sectional view of a dc motor so you can observe here this is the frame of the motor frame or yoke this is the i bolt to hold the or for lifting purpose this is uh, provided and here you can see the poles this is the poles and here this is the pole shoe and on the pole the winding is placed and this winding is known as the field winding and in the central position armature core is present which has slots and inside the armature slots the armature conductors are placed so this is the general construction of a dc motor so we have to understand the working principle of the motor a dc motor works on the principle that whenever a current carrying conductor is placed in a magnetic field it experiences a mechanical force so what is the principle whenever a current carrying conductor is placed in a magnetic field it experiences a mechanical force the direction of this force is given by fleming's left hand rule and the magnitude of the force is given by the equation f equals b l i newtons where b is the flux density in tesla or weber per meter squared l is the length of the conductor in meters and i is the current in the conductor in amps now to understand the complete working of a dc motor we have to understand what is oersted law the oersted law states that the flow of electricity through a conductor or a wire produces a magnetic field around the conductor so what do we understand any current carrying conductor sets up a magnetic field around itself so where there is electric current there is existence of magnetic field so here you can see now this is a wire conductor to which a supply is given here dc supply so this is the direction of the current and here you can observe there is the existence of a magnetic field around 
the current carrying conductor. Now, the right hand thumb rule. The thumb rule states that if a current carrying conductor is held in the right hand such that the thumb points in the direction of the current, then the fingers wrapped or curled around the conductor gives the direction of the magnetic field. So thumb rule, what does it say? See, you can see this is a conductor. The conductor is carrying current. Here, observe the arrow. This is the direction of the current. Now, if you hold the conductor in your right hand such that the thumb points in the direction of the current. This is very important. When you hold it, the thumb should point in the direction of the current. And the remaining fingers which are wrapping or closing around the conductor, that, that direction will give you the direction of the magnetic field. So you can see here, it is the fingers are clasping the conductor like this. You can observe this arrow. So that will be the direction of the magnetic field. So Oersted law said, any current carrying conductor sets up a magnetic field around itself. Oersted law said, any current carrying conductor sets up a magnetic field around itself. And the right hand thumb rule gives the direction of the magnetic field. Now, the Oersted rule also uh, stated that, like, found that for a straight wire carrying a steady current, DC current, steady current means DC current, the magnetic field lines encircle the current carrying wire. The magnetic field lines lie in a plane perpendicular to the wire. So observe here, this is the conductor which is carrying the current. The magnetic field that is produced or created around the conductor is perpendicular to the conductor. If the direction of the current is reversed, the direction of the magnetic field also reverses. So if you reverse the direct, now you can see the current is moving upwards. Suppose the current is made to flow downwards, then you have to hold the conductor in the reverse direction because thumb should always point in the direction of the current, thereby the field that is going to be created is also going, direction of it is also going to be reversed. The strength of the field is directly proportional to the magnitude of the current. So this field, what is the strength of this field is proportional to the magnitude of the current. Lesser the current, lesser the strength of the magnetic field. More the current, more is the strength of the magnetic field. Next, the strength of the field at any point is inversely proportional to the distance of the point from the wire. So, strength of the field. Now, if you take a point which is closer to the conductor, the strength there is going to be higher compared to a point you consider much farther away from the conductor. So if you are nearer to the current carrying conductor, the strength of the field is more. If you are farther away from the current carrying conductor, the strength of the magnetic field weakens. Now we have to understand what is Maxwell's right hand corkscrew rule. If a right-handed corkscrew is assumed to be held along the conductor and the screw is rotated such that it moves in the direction of the current, the direction of the magnetic field is same as 
the direction of rotation of the screw so you observe the figure here this is a right handed screw so if you start rotating the screw such that it advances or moves in the direction of the current suppose here this blue arrow represents the direction of current so if you start rotating the screw the screw advances in the direction of the current then the direction of rotation of the screw will give the direction of the magnetic field so in which direction you rotate that will give the direction of the magnetic field okay so with these basic uh, laws we can understand the uh, principle of operation of a dc motor much better now here you observe here there are two poles here this is the north pole and this is the south pole in the air gap between the pole a current carrying conductor is going to be placed okay so here a rectangular coil is going to be placed so this coil what you see is one end a this is the other end of the coil b so we can assume the current is entering at this point the current is entering at this point it flows through the rectangular coil of wire and it is coming out of the paper at the end b okay so entering is shown as a cross here and coming out of the plane of the paper what you see here can be represented as a point now both the arms of the rectangular coil is present in the magnetic field okay and the coil is also carrying current now here what happens there is two fields one field due to the magnet and the other field is due to the current carrying conductor because just now we have understood from the oersted law any current carrying conductor sets up a magnetic field around itself so now there are two magnetic fields present in the air gap when the two magnetic fields interact then a resultant magnetic field is going to be produced now the resultant magnetic field here is such that the lines of force here tends to pull the conductor a the conductor a downwards you can see this arrow it tends to pull it downwards and here at the other end the conductor b the force is such that you can see this this radial lines of force you can see tries to pull the conductor upward so here what is happening there are two magnetic fields one is due to the presence of north and south pole so there is a magnetic field another is due to the current carrying conductor so as per oersted law we learned that any current carrying conductor sets up a magnetic field around itself so the two magnetic fields interact and the resultant magnetic field is created such that the magnetic field around the conductor a tends to pull 
the conductor A downwards, and whereas that around the conductor B tends to pull the conductor B upwards. So a torque or a twisting moment is going to be set up in the air gap. We can understand here other. So imagine this is the north and south poles here. A conductor is placed. Let I be the direction of the current and F is the force, the direction of the force. So any current carrying conductor, when it is placed in a magnetic field, it will experience a force. So we have learned that. Next, here in this, you can see a rectangular loop here. You can see here, OK? So which is rotating in the air gap between the in the magnetic field. Then the two sides of the loop, which are at right angles to the magnetic field, will experience forces in the opposite direction. So one will be pulled upwards, the other will be pulled downwards. Just now we have understood why that twisting moment happens there. So here you can see there is a pair of forces creating a turning influence or torque to rotate the coil. So this is in case of a single coil. Here, suppose a number of co coils are going to be present, number of armature conductors, where you can see in practical motors have several loops on an armature to provide a more uniform torque. And the magnetic field is produced by an electromagnet arrangement called the field coils. So here you can see. So some of the conductors are under the influence of an upward pull. And some of the conductors here are under the influence of a downward pull. So totally, the central armature starts rotating. So further, you can understand here with this figure. So only magnets. This is the lines of force or the magnetic field. When you place a current carrying conductor, you can see here the conductors here. Three, co three coils are present. So here one end of the coil, you can see it carries a cross mark. That is current is entering into the uh, coil. Here, these three are the other end of the three coils where you see the dot. That means the current is coming out of the coil. So when you apply the right hand thumb rules around these current carrying conductors, you get the direction of the uh, magnetic field around the conductors. So these three will have the direction in one direction. The magnetic field direction is in one direction. And around these three conductors, it will be in the opposite direction. So now there is an interaction between the two magnetic fields. So here, what happens here is a twisting moment uh, occurs and the armature starts rotating. Now let us understand the Fleming's left hand rule. It states that when you stretch the three fingers of your left hand, that is the forefinger, that is the first one, that is the pointer or the index finger, the middle finger and the thumb at right angles to each other. So observe the figure here. So left hand, first three fingers, the thumb, this is the forefinger or the index finger, and this is the middle finger. So when the three fingers are stretched such that they are mutually perpendicular to each other, then if the forefinger is pointing in the direction of the flux, forefinger in the direction of the flux. The middle finger indicates the direction of the current. You can observe direction of current. Then the thumb gives the direction of motion of the conductor. So what does the left hand rule say? 
it tells that if you stretch the first three fingers of your left hand such that they are mutually perpendicular to each other and if the forefinger points in the direction of the flux the middle finger pointing points in the direction of current then the thumb gives the direction of motion of the conductor now let us come to the actual working of the motor so you have understood the principle so apply that here consider a current coil carrying current carrying coil placed in a magnetic field let the direction of the current in the coil b into the paper in conductor a and away from the paper in conductor b according to corkscrew rule so just now we have learned what is corkscrew rule the direction of the flux surrounding the conductor is in the clockwise direction and that around the conductor b is in the anti clockwise direction now there are two magnetic fields one due to the main field and the other due to the current in the armature conductors so this is a pictorial representation of all the stated statements so here this is a conductor current carrying conductor so it is in the form of a loop here current is entering here current is leaving where it is entering if you apply the thumb rule then the direction of the magnetic field either thumb rule or corkscrew rule both you can apply the direction of the uh, magnetic field is uh, uh, clockwise uh, anti clockwise here and here you can observe the current is in the opposite direction in this direction so here it is going to be clockwise so when you the same rule has been shown here that is you can apply the right hand thumb rule or the right hand corkscrew rule now all these principle you apply to an actual motor so this is the magnetic field in the air gap of the magnetic field a rectangular coil is placed so this section is let us say it is coil a and this section if you refer it as coil b then the direction of current you must observe here it is moving into the paper here and here in coil b it is coming away from the paper so the ends of the conductor are connected to a commutator segment brushes are placed over this commutator segment and this is connected to the external circuit here okay now the resultant of these two fields causes a spring action and hence the conductor a moves downwards and conductor b moves upwards thus the coil and in turn the armature on which the coil is placed rotate in the anti clockwise direction about the axis if a number of coils are placed on the armature all of them experience a torque as explained above and rotate the armature in the anti clockwise direction the direction of rotation of the armature depends upon the direction of the current through the conductors and it is determined by applying the fleming's left hand rule it's just another figure for you to understand you can understand here the arrows show the direction or the force that is being ex experienced by the uh, conductors if you say this is coil uh, a and this is coil b so here it is having an upward uh, force this is experiencing a downward force so in all the armature starts rotating in the anti clockwise direction so you can observe here you can
can observe the direction. This is the total overall direction of rotation of the armature. Now, we have to understand what is back EMF. When the armature rotates, the armature conductors cut the main field flux and hence an EMF is going to be induced in the armature. So you have to recall the Faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction. So the armature conductors, when it is rotating, it is going to cut the main field flux and hence an EMF is induced in the armature. This induced EMF acts in opposition to the applied voltage. Hence, it is called as back EMF. It is also called as counter EMF. So why this happens? Now, this is according to Lenz's law. In the law says, whenever there is an in, induced EMF in a conductor, it is always in such a direction that the current it would produce would oppose the change which causes the induced EMF. That is, it opposes the very cause that is producing it. This induced EMF acts in opposite direction to the armature supply voltage. And hence, it is called as back EMF. And back EMF is given by the equation EB is equal to, it is represented as EB, it is equal to phi Z N P by 60A. Uh, unit is volts, where N is the speed in RPM, uh, phi is the flux per pole, Z is the number of conductors, that is the armature conductors, P is the number of pole pairs, whether it's a two pole machine, four pole. Uh, machine eight pole like that it depends on the number of poles number of pole pairs and a is the area of cross section of the conductor and eb is the back emf so here you can understand this is the supply voltage so current is flowing ia means armature current which is flowing to the motor and eb you can observe the direction it is opposite to the applied voltage or the supply voltage. This induced EMF is set up as per Lenz's law opposite to the applied voltage. So this is the equivalent circuit. You can represent EB as shown here. Now, the armature current IA is given by net voltage by uh, resistance. So we know Ohm's law, V equals IR, I is equal to V by R. So here net voltage is given by V minus EB because V is in one direction. If this is uh, the plus and EB is produced opposing the supply voltage. So it carries a minus here. So V minus EB divided by RA where RA is the resistance of the here, armature circuit. You can observe, this is the equivalent circuit. So RA is the resistance of the armature circuit. Therefore, EB, the back EMF is also equal to V minus IA into RA, where V is the applied voltage in volts. And the power developed is given by P equals EB into IA watts. Now let us go through the different types of DC motors. So we have different types of DC motors depending on the connection of the field windings and the number of fields. It can be classified as series motors, shunt motors, and compound motors. Compound motors further can be classified as cumulative compound motors, 
and differential compound motors. Cumulative compound motors can be further classified as short shunt cumulative compound motors and long shunt cumulative compound motors. Similarly, differential compound motors can be further classified as short shunt differential compound motors and long shunt differential compound motors. So these are the different types, series, shunt and compound motors. So this is a pictorial uh, representation of the classification of DC motors. So here you see the DC motor. So it can be separately excited, self-excited or a permanent magnet. Self-excited DC motors are further classified as shunt, series and compound motors. Compound motors further are of two types, cumulative compound and differential compound. And both these have long shunt as well as short shunt construction. Okay. So further again, it can be represented by using the symbols it is. So separately excited is as shown, self-excited series, this is the representation of series wound self-excited motor, this is shunt wound and here it is compound wound, this is the symbol of a long shunt, this is symbol of short shunt. Okay, so we have seen the classification and the first we have to understand what is separately excited DC motor. As the name signifies, the field coils or the field windings are energized by a separate DC source. So observe the figure here, the circuit diagram here. So this is the DC motor, EB is the back EMF, see the arrow direction, so that shows that it is opposing the applied voltage, RA is the resistance of the armature, IA is the armature current and the field winding here you can see is placed separately and it is excited separately from a separate DC source, IF is the field current. Such a type of construction is known as separately excited DC motor. Self-excited DC motor. So as the name implies, in this type of motor, the current in the windings is supplied by the machine or the motor itself. So self-excited DC motor is further divided into shunt wound, series wound and compound wound motors. So here you can see the field winding is connected parallel to the armature winding. So the armature current itself is being fed to the field also. So there is no separate excitation for the field winding. So that is why it is called as self-excited. So this is a shunt wound motor. Here you can observe the field winding is in series with the armature winding. So here it is a series wound motor and in this figure you can observe you can observe there is the series field winding along with the armature winding and parallel to that there is the shunt field winding also. That is why it is called as compound wound generator. In all the three cases you can observe 
there is no separate excitation for the field windings hence they are all self excited dc motors now what is a series motor in this motor the field winding is connected in series with the armature winding the field winding is made of a few number of turns of thick copper wire and it has low resistance so you can observe here this is the field winding this is the armature winding this is the motor symbol of a motor so the field winding is connected in series with the armature winding you can see both of them are in series and characteristic is it carries few turns of thick copper wire few turns of thick copper wire once the thickness of the copper wire is more you know by law of resistance r is equal to rho l by a so more the area of cross section lesser will be the resistance so series motor has got low resistance so in a series motor same current flows through the field and the armature winding so if this is connected to the supply so this is the line current the same current is flowing through the field and through the armature also therefore ia is equal to isc is equal to il that means the current is the same in all the windings il is the line current in amps isc is the series field current in amps and ia is the armature current in amps so you must observe this is the line current here is the series current isc and this is the armature current same current is flowing so all of them are equal so this is the characteristic of a series motor just a picture showing you a series motor so this is the commutator brushes this is the central shaft this is the rotor coils and this is the field coils which are stationary that is why they are also called as stator now what are the application of series motor dc series motors are used where load is directly connected to the motor and where high starting torque is required so it is used for running electric locomotives that is trains rapid transit uh, transit systems trolley cars trams cranes fans conveyors hoists and elevators so these are some of the applications next we'll understand what is a shunt motor in this motor the field winding is connected in parallel with the armature winding so field winding and armature winding are in parallel the field winding is of thin copper wire so here you can understand the area of cross section is less so we know that r is equal to rho l by a area of cross section is less means it is inversely proportional to the resistance okay so it has got high resistance so observe the figure here shunt motor 
you can see here z1 z2 is the field winding it is connected parallel to the armature winding you can see a1 a2 is the armature winding so it is connected parallel to it okay so that is why they are called as shunt motor and the characteristic of the field winding here is more number of turns of thin cross sectional area therefore it has high resistance in a shunt motor the line current il divides into armature and into the shunt field windings so you can see here when you connect it to the dc supply here this is the line current when it comes here it finds two paths to flow part of it will flow through the field winding and some part of it will flow through the flow through to the armature so the current flowing through the field is called as if that is the field current or you can also call it as ish because this is shunt field you can call it as shunt current shunt field current and ia is the armature current so il is equal to sum of these two currents therefore il equals ia plus ish ia is the armature current ish is the field current shunt field current so this is another picture showing you a shunt motor so here you can see this is the stator here this is the poles pole shoe field winding is present on the poles this is the armature armature core and here you can see this is the armature winding so shaft this is the brushes and the commutator the applications of dc shunt motor it is a general purpose motor and it is used where almost a constant speed and medium starting torque is required it is used for driving constant speed line shafting lift machines wood working machines blowers and fans centrifugal pumps reciprocating pumps milling machines and drilling machines so these are some of the applications where dc shunt motor is preferred to be so it gives almost a constant speed compound motor in this motor the field winding is connected both in series and in parallel to the armature winding it is of two types cumulative compound motor and differential compound motor so here you can see what we meant by both series and shunt so this is the armature so across the armature the shunt field is present along the armature that is in series with it the series field is present that is both the series field and the shunt field is utilized in its construction in this form of connection here is cumulative compound dc motor short shunt short shunt because here the shunt field is across armature and you must observe the polarities here this is s1 is represented as plus s2 as minus the two ends of the series field winding and here you can observe the shunt field plus f1 this is minus f2 so here we will understand further in the definition uh, just see how it is being represented here this is a cumulative compound dc uh, short shunt motor this is differential compound dc shunt motor 
this is s1 plus s2 minus here it is f2 minus f1 plus so observe this now this is shunt field this field winding as well as the armature winding so you can see so it is why that is why it's called as long shunt shunt itself means it is in parallel short shunt means it is just across cross both armature and c so suppose this connection is so you must understand the difference between short shunt and long shunt so here you can clearly follow now what is cumulative compound motor in this motor the two field windings that is the shunt and the series are connected such that the fluxes produced by them add or assist each other that is series field flux adds to shunt field flux so you can see here this is the series field this is the shunt field and this is the armature here okay now the direction is such that flux produced by the series field why am i telling flux produced because we know that any current carrying conductor sets up a magnetic field around itself magnetic field is nothing but flux so the direction of this flux around the series field and the direction of the flux around the shunt field both of them add up or assist each other such a motor is called as cumulative compound motor so either it can be short shunt cumulative compound motor or it can be long shunt so in long shunt the shunt the field winding is connected across both it is connected just across the armature differential compound motor in this motor the two fields that is the shunt and the series are connected such that the series field flux acts in opposition to the shunt field flux thus the main magnetic field is weakened so the two fluxes one flux due to the series field winding another flux action of these two fluxes are opposite to each other opposite to each other so it is it becomes a subtractive field not an additive field it becomes a subtractive field thus the main magnetic field is weakened so again differential compound motors can be connected either in short shunt or it can be connected in long shunt way now applications of cumulative compound motors are whenever there is sudden change in the load such as in rolling mills shearing mills uh, machines punching machines heavy planers etc and where large starting torque and a fairly constant speed is required such as in cranes elevators lifts conveyor Noise, etc. In all these applications, cumulative compound motors are used. Differential compound motors are rarely used in practice. So here you can see some pictures of the motors. So one is 
opened in section you can observe that so this is another dc compound motor these are very small motors their voltage ratings are very less around 6 volts 12 volts 24 volts uh, so these are very small uh, rating of motors next we have to understand the selection criteria of dc motors includes so whenever we want to select a motor for a particular application then what are all the uh, criteria that we have to keep in mind first is the voltage availability for example if it is a portable de uh, device then it is battery operated many rack mounted devices and tools operate from a 24 volt power supply dc motors are also available for as low as 1.5 volts and as high as 48 volts dependent on the required power so for depending on our application we have to choose the voltage and that particular rating of motor has to be selected next is the physical size this is often one of the limiting factors in motor selection like in desktop 3d printers portable medical devices and hand tools small sized motors are used efficiency is another primary concern which you need to worry about so that power consumption uh, has to be maximized so power consumption to maximize battery life such as in a surgical tool or unmanned security drone so <clears throat> When you have to maximize on the battery life, you have to pay attention to the efficiency factor of the motor. Torque and speed also have an effect on the motor frame size. High torque motors are often large in size than low torque motors. For example, it takes a larger motor to rotate the magnets in an MRI than it does to run the windows in the doors of an automobile. So if it is being used, motors being used for MRI scanning purpose are larger motors. Whereas the motors used for opening and closing of the windows in cars, it is a smaller motor. So Torque and speed also have an effect on the motor frame size. And lastly, motor duty cycle could be one of the most telling aspects of a lot of semiconductor production machines. Intermittent operation reduces the wear and tear on the motor and it increases the life of the motor. So that is how the motor is going to be operated. So when it is started, it is at what speed then later on does it pick up more speed like this the uh, the speed variations that is how the motor is going to work over a cycle that is motor duty cycle next coming to rating of the motors unlike generators and transformers Electric motors are rated in kilowatts instead of kVA. So, electric motors are rated in kilowatts. Earlier, we have learned that generators and transformers are rated in kVA, kilo volt amperes. We know that kVA is nothing but product of voltage into current, and kilowatt is product of voltage into current into power factor in case of transformers and generator the designer or the manufacturer does not know 
what is the actual power factor of the system because while designing the designer cannot predict the power factor so since he cannot predict the type of load he can he does not know the power factor that is why generators and transformers are rated in kilovolt amperes the power factor of an electrical system depends on the nature of the connected load depends on the nature of the connected load that is whether it is inductive resistive or capacitive since the power factor is unknown both generator and transformer are rated in kilovolt amperes in case of a motor it has a fixed power factor that is why power factor is included in the name plate data hence electric motors are rated in kilowatts and not in kva also motor is a device which converts electrical power into mechanical power in this case the load is not electrical but mechanical the motor output is mechanical in nature only active power which has to be converted into mechanical load is taken into consideration moreover the motor power factor does not depend on the load and it works on any power factor because of its design so here you can see the name plate data so this is a motor on the motor a name plate data will be fixed like this okay it is a plate name plate details we call it so here is one example you can see <coughs> so you can see here this is how it is all the details uh, electrical details will be uh printed on this so you can see this is a 1.5 hp continuous duty permanent magnet dc motor so you can observe here this is another name plate details which is at Five fifty-seven bar, thousand seven hundred twenty-five RPM, two thirty volts. Current carrying capacity of the motor is twenty-nine point six amperes. Winding type is shunt. Okay, so like this, all the details that is the voltage, current, power, uh, frequency. all these details will be present on in the name plate uh, details so we have to understand the conversion of hp horsepower to kilowatts so one electrical horsepower is equivalent to 746 watts so if you represent that as kilowatts it is 0.746 watts so divide by 1000 you get it as 0.746 kilowatts so if you want to do the conversion of horsepower into kilowatts it is given by this equation power in kilowatts is equal to power in hp multiplied by the factor 0.746 so when you multiply by this you get in kilowatts if you multiply by 746 you get in watts so here is one example convert 10 hp to kilowatt so p in kilowatts power in kilowatts is equal to power in hp he has given it as 10 into 0.746 0.746 so that is equal to 7.46 kilowatts so a 10 hp 
motor equivalent wattage uh, rating is going to be 7.46 kilowatts similarly conversion of kilowatt to hp one electrical horsepower is equal to 0.746 kilowatts so we know this okay so to convert kilowatts to horsepower it is given by the equation power in horsepower is equal to power in kilowatts divided by 0.746 so an example convert 10 kilowatts to electrical horsepower so hp power in horsepower is equal to 10 kilowatts divided by 0.746 that will come up to around 13.405 hp so you should know the conversion how to convert from kilowatts to hp and hp to kilowatts thank you if you have any questions you can ask